What's good, my friends? This is the most interactive sports talk show anywhere. It's Offsides, Mark Ryan and Diesel, and we are the Fan Upstate rolling on until 7 o'clock p.m. today. Always thrilled to have you guys with us. Could not do it without you. Appreciate you more than we can ever put into words. Here's how you guys can take part in the show. You can give us a ring at 844-FAN-PHONE. That's 844-326-3663. And you can hit us on the text line at 71307. Just start your text with the word FAN. And away you go on the show, my friends. Uh, all right, my friends, we are jam-packed on the show today. Had a chance to uh, sit down with one of the best NFL analysts in the country over the weekend. Mark Schlereth, Fox Sports NFL analyst, sat down with him, chatted with him. We will share that interview with you coming up at either 3.40 or 4. We've got Chris Phillips coming your way at 4.40 p.m. We've got the top five at five. We've got either or. And we have you here on the most interactive sports radio show anywhere. So fired up to be here. Love you. Mean it. Appreciate you. Thank you so much. Guys, March Madness is here. It has been revealed. And I want to open by sharing something that shocked me, if I'm honest with you. Okay? Jay Billis. All right. He does say in his Twitter bio, uh, opinions are my own, but should be adopted by you immediately. Clemson against New Mexico. Here is Jay Billis's pick. New Mexico. Oh, my gosh. This, he says, is an upset pick. Clemson has been uninspired at certain times. Diesel, have you ever seen a bigger in, uh, indictment of the head coach it's not than, good. than somebody saying Clemson has been uninspired at times? What? Why don't you just tell them their heart's not in it while you're at it? And the Lobos are really good offensively. I don't like either team to get past Baylor. So, I mean, consider what Jay Billis is telling you here. Clemson is not going to have a long tournament run. He likes them to lose in the first round against New Mexico. And then no matter who wins, he likes Baylor to beat either one of these teams. Now, I want to share this with you here. Um, I, you know, and it's it's he says the upset potential is high in this game. He says Coach Brownell had an NCAA tournament team last season but was snubbed by the committee. This year there was no question. Road wins at Alabama, North Carolina, Pittsburgh, Syracuse, Florida State. Bolsters, bolstered a strong case for its at-large berth. Brownell has a great inside-outside combo and P.J. Hall and Joe Girard, the top two scores, two top scores. Hall can step away and drill a three and also dominate in the paint while Girard is a great three-point shooter and an automatic free-throw shooter. Clemson is a better offensive team than a defensive team, and its defense is solid but not spectacular. He says of New Mexico, their opponent, the Mount West, Mountain West champion, is an outstanding offensive team because it has multiple scores that can each go off. The Lobos are 26 and 9 and won four straight after losing a heartbreaker at Utah State. They take care of the ball and defend at a high level. Point guard Donovan Dent has size and length and is a great passer, leading New Mexico in assists. Dent, Dent can really penetrate and make plays for himself or others. Jalen House is the best player, both all Mountain West and Mountain West Conference all defensive team, and is the top three point threat. Jamal Mashburn Jr., hey, I know that name is one of the best mid-range scorers in the tournament, but can also hit a three. So you got a three-headed monster of uh, New Mexico that you are facing. Donovan Dent, Jalen House, Jamal Mashburn for New Mexico, and Jay Billis is picking New Mexico. Ay, caramba, Clemson. Ay, caramba. If he is right, if he is right, by the way, Charleston uh, and Alabama, Four versus 13. He said upset potential is low. Uh, he has Alabama winning. He says it's a great upset pick because Charleston can really play, but because Sears is so good on Alabama, Alabama's scoring ability, uh, he likes Alabama's scoring ability to overcome its defensive issues. So he's got all three, Jay Billis does, 
South Carolina teams losing in the first round. Losing in the first round. What a hating ass son of, son of a you know what? Right. So I mean that's that, that is that is tough, man. That is that is brutal. Um, you know, like it's it's been 20 years since we got three guys, three teams into March Madness. It's been 20 years since Dave Chappelle's play I hate his ball. But this is the redux of that. I hate you. I hate you. I don't even know you, but I hate your guts. And I'll tell you what, man. I'll tell you what. Uh, I thought Diesel, by and large, uh, I thought the SEC kind of got a little bit screwed, a little bit of disrespect with some of the seeds. I'm watching the SEC final yesterday. Uh, Auburn, Florida. Auburn beats Florida. No team in the country is going to beat Auburn playing their fourth game in four days. It's just not going to happen. Okay. Uh, that team is the only team in America that's in the top 10 in offensive efficiency and defensive efficiency. You are not beating Auburn playing your fourth game in four days. That's just never going to happen. Um, but I will say this, you know, I was looking, listening to the announcer, Jimmy Dykes, and he was like, you know, Florida's going to be a five seed. You know, Florida's losing the game, and he's like, Florida's going to be a five seed. Florida is a seven seed. Okay, seven seed. He said Auburn's going to be a three seed. Auburn is a four seed. Like, largely, in my opinion, the SEC was seeded one seed below where just about everyone thought they were going to be in every single region. The only exception to that was Kentucky. Kentucky, brand power invitational. Kentucky overseeded, in my opinion, out of three. AM beat Kentucky. Uh, and I, Kentucky still gets the three seed. I thought or, South Carolina was really disrespected with their seed. Six seed for South Carolina. They play tomorrow. Clemson, South Carolina, who you got? Clemson just lost to Notre Dame. Okay. Clemson is just lost to Wake Forest. Clemson um, just lost to Boston College in the ACC. Clemson losing to mediocre team after mediocre team after ever loving mediocre team. Can you believe that crap? And they give them the same seat as South Carolina. Diesel, like, you know, the Gamecock fans, they th they like to say we don't say anything nice about them. I think South Carolina should be a higher seed than Clemson by two seats. Okay? I'd have South Carolina five and Clemson a seven. I think there should be two seats different. Not the same seed. What kind of disrespect is this? You know, I do believe that you are going to see an SEC run in this tournament. I think you're going to see at least four teams from the SEC in the Sweet 16. Florida uh, got screwed by getting a seven seed, and they're going to get the winner of Boise State, Colorado. Diesel, that play-in game, are you in an advantage if you win that play-in game, or are you at a disadvantage because you had to play? The whole rest versus rust thing. I can't figure out if I like that for Florida or don't like that for Florida because Florida plays the play-in winner of Boise State and Colorado in the 7-10 matchup. I can't tell if I like that or dislike that. It used to be the 11 seed that had to play the play-in game. This year, it's the 10 seed. But let me read you what uh, Jay Billis says about South Carolina and Oregon. All right? Oregon. He says... Uh, if UConn's Danny Hurley doesn't win it, Lamont Paris should be the national coach of the year. This is a tough team that resembles a Bo Ryan Wisconsin team that doesn't turn it over much, doesn't foul much, and knows how to play. What is odd is that the polls and standings love South Carolina, but the analytics do not. South Carolina is rated outside the top 40 in both offensive and defensive efficiency and outside of the top 40 overall by KenPom.com. With 25 regular season wins, including wins against Mississippi State, Kentucky, Tennessee, Texas A&M, and Florida, South Carolina has proved to be legit. The top scorers are Michi Johnson, the Ohio State transfer and top three-point shooter. He has nine regular season games with 20 or more points. And B.J. Mack, the versatile 6'8 swingman who hit 45 threes before the SEC tournament. South Carolina is a tempo control, low turnover, tough team. He then says the upset potential is medium. South Carolina plays at a slower tempo so it can hang with better teams, but lesser teams can stay in it against the Gamecocks too. And then he says winner. Oregon, South Carolina, are you ready? His winner is Oregon. 
Coach Dana Altman has never lost a first-round game since he showed up in Eugene. South Carolina is going to be tough, but a healthy Dante will be the difference. Has never lost a first-round game. How about that? Big man Nafali Dante is back, provides low-post scoring and efficient finishing, as well as capable rebounding and rim protection. Um, I think Oregon lost in the, the Pac-12 conference tournament to uh, Colorado. Guys, Jay Billis says not a single team from South Carolina is going to advance past their first round game. And both Clemson and South Carolina are the higher seeds in their, in their contest. Uh, South Carolina is favored by a one and a half points over Oregon and is listed as a 55% chance to win um, according to the Basketball Power Index. 54% chance to win. Uh, how about Clemson in the 6-11 matchup? 6-11 matchup, New Mexico. How about this? Favored by a point and a half as an 11 seed over Clemson. Could you have a bigger announcement that Clemson was overseeded as a 6 seed? Than this overseeded man, New Mexico, the 11 seed, actually favored. Wow, over Clemson, incredible. Alabama favored by nine and a half points over Charleston. Um, really, really, really interesting stuff. I guys, I'm. I thought the SEC was disrespected. I feel like the state of South Carolina is being disrespected. I felt like South Carolina should have been two seed lines higher than Clemson. Not one, but two, at least. You know, guys, I wouldn't have faulted you if you had South Carolina a four and Clemson an eight, you know? But to, to say, okay, we're going to have them both sixes. South Carolina is the best six seed. Clemson is the worst. You know, I mean, let's consider the direction of which where these teams are going right now. Yeah, as right up here says, the Tigers have not closed out some games late and they've lost some close ones. He doesn't, he doesn't trust Clemson. He doesn't trust them to go out and get this win. And that can't, there can't be a bigger indictment in my mind on Brad Brownell's program. When you've got the talent that they've got, when you've got PJ Hall, when you've got Ian Scheffel, when you've got Joseph Gerard, and you can't win games late, you crumble down the stretch, you stumble in late, late in games when it really, really matters. There can't be a bigger indictment on a, on a coach than that. That is entirely on coaching. You've got the players, you've got the athletes. You should be out athleting. New Mexico by far. So, you know, it's a, it's absurd that we still have Clemson fans saying things like, well, if he wins a game, it's good enough for me. Just getting into the tournament. That's good enough for me. Let's extend Brad Brown. Now stop with this. Uh, we got a texture that says, uh, Mark giving South Carolina six seed is saying they should be ranked 24th to 27th. Uh, that's not true. Texture. You're off by one. A six seed means that they have you ranked 21st to 24th, okay? 21st to 24th, which still in and of itself is a slap in the face to South Carolina with what they've done this year. Uh, and, you know, Diesel, Jay Billis nailed, nailed what you and I have argued about with South Carolina the whole year. He says the ratings and the poll guys love them. The analytics do not. They do not rank in the top 40 in either offensive or defensive efficiency. They played Auburn, who is top 10 in both offensive and defensive efficiency, and got smoked both times they played. Both times they played, they got smoked. So, uh, guys, that's that's where we're at. The brackets are out. Uh, it's exciting as hell that to all these teams from our beautiful state are in this thing, are dancing. I love it. It's fantastic. However, in my humble opinion, uh, the SEC got screwed a little bit here. I think the SEC got a little bit screwed with the seedings, with the seedings. All right, my friends, coming up next on the show, whose bubble burst? Oh, this is heartbreaking, Diesel. Heartbreaking. Do you know there's going to be no Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in the tournament? Who did they lose to? Who did they lose to? They had 28 wins. But they lost in the conference tournament, I guess. That sucks. Biggest bubbles bursting coming your way next. Offsides, Mark Ryan and Diesel. We are the Fan Up State.
It's offsides, Mark Ryan and Diesel. We are the fan upstate. Your biggest takeaways from the bracket reveal yesterday. What were they? What do you think they were? Biggest takeaways for you that we see. Jay Billis having South Carolina, the whole state, not even getting a win with three births, three chances to do so. He's got Oregon over South Carolina. He's got New Mexico over Clemson. He's got Alabama over College of Charleston. All the disrespect. I really hope the Palmetto State proves him wrong, man. I really do. Texter says, Mark, I 100% agree that Clemson loses its first game. Brownell can coach to save his life. Mark, another texter says, hate to break it to you, but I have Florida losing to the Boise State Colorado winner. I see them upsetting y'all. Texter says, giving the Gamecocks a sixth seed uh, is a slap in the face. Do you think Presbyterian College wins the play-in game? And if they win, they face South Carolina women's. Um, the correct answer, Texter, is who cares? Who cares? Uh, the winner of the play-in game of the women's tournament is a sacrificial lamb that will not even provide half of the points. South Carolina will double up whoever they play in the first round. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. Um, so uh, I got Diesel on a little research project right now, doing a little research project on the teams that ended up ended up making the tournament versus those who did not. Guys, it's the week of the best single best event in all of sports. The single best event in all of sports, and uh, we are pumped for it. Tomorrow we've got two play in games. We've got Wagner and Howard. Wagner is located where again? Staten Island, New York. Wagner plays in what conference again? I have no idea. Wagner, I don't even know her. Yeah. Wagner, Wagner I didn't even touch her. Wagner is the Seahawks. They're the sixth seed. They have a play-in game tomorrow. Virginia against Colorado State. Now, Colorado State's head coach, Diesel, used to be Furman's head coach. Is that correct? That's that's, that's correct, Nico Medved. Nico Medved. It's got Colorado State in there. We're pulling for him. Listen to my connection there, folks. I lived in Fort Collins, Colorado. Okay? Lived in Fort Collins, Colorado. Nico Medved, Colorado State is in Fort Collins, Colorado. That's the university where I lived. Okay? Uh, so imagine like the, 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 the parallel paths here. He coaches Furman, then coaches Colorado State, I lived in Fort Collins, Colorado, and now I'm living here. How about that? How crazy is that? Colorado State 24 and 10, Virginia 23 and 10. Those games coming your way tomorrow. Then on Wednesday, we get Grambling State and Montana State um, in the play in game, and Colorado and Boise State, two West Coast teams, Colorado favored by. Two and a half points in that one. Colorado 24 and 10. Boise State 22 and 10. Um, favorite Cinderella's that you guys see in the bracket thus far. You know, who who jumps out to you as teams that could really, really make a make a deep run in this thing? I like what I've seen out of Duquesne. I've watched them. Uh, Diesel, you were telling me that the uh what was it, Toledo won the Mac four years in a row? They won the, the MAC regular season four years in a row and have not won their conference tournament. So they have won, they have been the best team in the conference four years in a row without making the NCAA tournament. Unbelievable. Guys, who is your favorite Cinderella as we uh, get this party kickstarted here with the tournament? Uh, I like McNeese. McNeese, their head coach is Will Wade. Will Wade went to Clemson. Clemson alum. Clemson fans want to bring Will Wade back to Clemson. All right. Graham Neff, go ahead and have Will Wade on speed dial, will you? Go ahead, have him on speed dial. Uh, because many folks have Clemson losing in the first round game. McNeese gets a very beatable Gonzaga team this year who did not win their own conference. That's the 12 5 matchup. McNeese, all they've done this year is go 30 and 3 as a 12 seed. I like McNeese as a Cinderella that could at least go all the way to the Sweet 16. What do you say? Who is your Cinderella, my friend? 71307. 
Just start your text with the word fan and away you go on the show. Texter says, not a dark horse per se, but I like Illinois. Three NBA guys, 10 deep, a lot of seniors. Uh, Texter, you're right. It's not a, a, not a dark horse. They're number 10 in the country. You know, not, not, not a, uh, I mean, they're top 10 team. Uh, dark horse means, you know, they're unheralded, that nobody really knows what to expect, that nobody really knows, uh, nobody really expects anything of them. That's McNeese State. Everybody's got to have a Cinderella, okay? That's the rule. You can't play in any March Madness games if you don't have a Cinderella. So I'm asking you to at least have one Cinderella uh, that could make a serious run in this tournament this year. Cinderella's, okay, can be defined for the purposes of this segment as 11 seeds or lower. Okay, 11 seeds or lower. So we have possible Cinderella's of Duquesne, Stetson. All right, Duquesne, Stetson, UAB, Yale, Moorhead State, South Dakota State, and Howard or Wagner. Uh, we also have uh, Grand Canyon, Charleston, New Mexico, Colgate, Long Beach State University, other potential Cinderella's, Longwood, James Madison, Vermont, uh, Oakland, Western Kentucky, Montana State or Grambling. And then you've got McNeese State, you've got Akron, you have St. Peter's. Who is your Cinderella? You guys, the, the odds are that these teams are going to be, uh, th- th- one of these teams is going to advance. One of these teams is going to roll on. One of these teams is going all the way to the Sweet 16. 844-326-3663. On the Renewal by Anderson fan phone is where you can get to us. That's 844-FAN-PHONE. 844-F-A-N-F-O-N-E is where you can get to us on the show. Are we in agreement, ladies and gentlemen, that this event right here is the best event in all sports? Are we in agreement on that? You know, I I say the college football playoff is third, World Cup is second, and March Madness is first. Most of you would have the Super Bowl uh, in your top three sports events. I've got the Super Bowl just outside my top three. But this is the best event in all all of sports, right? My old man is up for a couple of weeks. Uh, I'm excited that he's here for the tournament. I watched Florida in the SEC tournament with him. Over the weekend, it was a blast. Got to see him against Alabama, AM, yesterday against Auburn, even in the loss. Look, there's no moral victories when you play for when you when you root for a school like Florida. No moral victories. That said, I will tell you guys um, that I was proud. I was proud of my Gators. Proud of my Gators for making it all the way to the conference final. Oh, I don't know if you saw this, Diesel. Florida's center. Micah Handlogden is a seven foot one and suffered a compound fracture of his lower leg in the game yesterday where there was blood on the court, which means the bone came through the skin. And it was one of those where like you have two minutes of silence on the air. The announcers aren't saying anything. And I said to my dad, have you ever seen this before? Where it's just like the cameras on the court and everyone's running on the court. You got 20 medical people on the court. And the announcers aren't saying anything. And, you know, you're like, okay, are they going to show you the replay? The replay was so grotesque, they decided not to show the replay. So it's just nothing but a still shot of the of the basketball court. And uh, Micah Hand logged in of the, uh, of the Gators, broke his lower, lower leg. Uh, compound fracture, bone through the skin, really, really hard to see. He's a seven-foot-one sophomore, transferred over from Marshall. Oh, man. That was rough. That was rough for the Gators yesterday. By the way, I do like Florida's uh, draw. Um, Look, you get by Boise State, Colorado. If you ask me, Mark, you got to play one second seed in the second round. Um, Marquette would be my choice. I'd rather play Marquette than any of the other two seeds. Iowa State just beat Houston by 26 points. Arizona uh, is an absolute behemoth out west. Tennessee. No, thank you. 
Florida, if they beat Boise State or Colorado, gets, in my opinion, the most beatable two seed in Marquette. If you beat Marquette, you likely get a three seed Kentucky that you already beat on the road this year. Kentucky just lost to Texas A&M in the SEC tournament by double digits. So I, I like Florida's draw. I, I really like Florida's draw. Uh, let's do this, guys. 844-326-3663. The best and worst case scenario for Clemson and South Carolina in the tournament this year. Best and worst case. Um, you know, Clemson side guys, that their play hasn't inspired a ton of hope and optimism of late. Right? Just, just calling a spade a spade here. Jay Billis says he thinks Clemson or New Mexico, neither one gets by Baylor in the next round. Um, I agree with that. I think Baylor is too quick, too athletic. Defense is too strong. Uh, I think the best case for Clemson is to win a game. I think the worst case is obviously to lose to New Mexico. South Carolina, on the other hand, I think it, the picture looks far more rosy, if I may. Beat Oregon, and I'm picking the Gamecocks to beat Oregon. Okay? Creighton, I think, is a very winnable game. Um, you know, South Carolina has seven losses on the year. Seven. Creighton has 11 losses on the season. Um, you can't tell me that a team with South Carolina's def defensive proficiency can't beat a team with 11 losses. I think these Big East teams, I think there's been an East Coast bias. I think there's been uh, there's been a bias towards these East Coast teams, the Big East, all year long. I, I like South Carolina's chances. I got to be honest with you. I really, really do. I like their chances to survive and advance here. Creighton was your third, uh, tied for second place team in the in the Big East. Um, 14 and six in that conference. No big deal. I mean, big deal. 14 and six. South Carolina was, uh, what, 12 and five, 13 and five in the SEC? I, I, that's a winnable game for South Carolina. I don't see why that wouldn't be a winnable game for the Gamecocks. Then you beat Creighton, you're in the Sweet 16. Who do you play then? Well, you might play Texas, who's a seven seed. Uh, you could get Virginia, who's a 10, or you, might, you most probably would get Tennessee. And Tennessee is where the run would end for South Carolina, provided that Tennessee gets by Texas or Virginia or Colorado State. I could see South Carolina advancing all the way until the Elite Eight. But it depends on one thing. Tennessee is not a good matchup for the Gamecocks. Auburn is not a good matchup for the Gamecocks. Tennessee needs to be upset by St. Peter's. St. Peter's is one of those schools that comes in here and upsets teams. Did so a couple of years ago. Or Texas or Virginia would need to upset Tennessee. Okay? With an upset of Tennessee, I, I think the ceiling for South Carolina is all the way potentially to the Elite Eight. Not the Final Four. I don't think that level of talent is there. But I think the, the probability, the chances are very strong that South Carolina could make it to the Sweet 16 or beyond. Clemson, win a game, man. Win a game. I mean, that's, that's, all, I, that's all I can say for you right now, man. That is all I can say. Uh, feel very badly, by the way, guys, for Yale going up against uh, Auburn. Feel very, very badly for them. Um, <laughs> Auburn, I, I couldn't have been more impressed with what I saw from Auburn yesterday. Honestly, just, uh, that team suffocates you defensively. They held Florida to its lowest point total of the entire season in, uh, in yesterday's game. Unbelievable. 71307 on the text line is where you can get to us. Just start your text with the word fan and away you go. Uh, Texter is claiming Long Beach State to be Cinderella. Uh, they fire their head coach and then go dancing. Texter says, Mark, the Masters is the best sports event of the year. Texter says, not a Cinderella, but Auburn got screwed in the seating. Yeah. I mean, amen to that, right? They royally got screwed. I thought a lot of these SET, SEC teams got screwed. In the seating, just being being totally honest with you. You know, I'm, I'm watching the game yesterday. They're like, Auburn's a three, Florida's a five. How about Auburn's a four and Florida's a seven? Auburn in the in the coaches poll and the AP poll 
Auburn is the number seven team in America, Diesel. Number seven team in America, and they're a four seed. How does it make sense? Number seven team in America, the second seed should be five, six, seven, and eight. Auburn's a s- number seven. Okay. <laughs> they're number seven, and they're a four seed. Like that, that is totally seeding screwed that is going on here. And I feel like a Scrooge about this. It's brutal. Make it stop. All right, guys. Uh, Florida, by the way, number 20. Oh, Florida is number 23 in the coaches poll and unranked in the AP poll. Some differences of opinion flying right there. Uh, You know what other potential upset I really like? Samford over Kansas. Got a bird's eye view of Samford a week ago today at the SOCON Tournament Championship. Sanford has everything you need to pull an upset. They got a uh, they got a big time inside presence with Acho Acho. They got great three point shooting on the outside. All right, Kansas meanwhile has been just getting absolutely blown out. Sanford might be a team that I pick to have a lot of upsets. Might be a big upset team for me. We will soon see. 844-326-3663 is the number to get to us on the show this afternoon. Your thoughts welcome on all of the above. Let me ask you guys this on Clemson. What ultimately will happen with Brad Brownell? What is your gut feeling? Call your shot right now. Call your shot right now, my friends, on Brad Brownell. We are going to let you think about that, ponder that, debate it. We're going to call our own shot on Brad Brunel when we come back. Right here on the most interactive sports radio show anywhere, it's Offsides, Mark Ryan and Diesel, and we are the Fan Up State. It's Offsides, Mark Ryan and Diesel. We are the Fan Upstate. Find us on all your favorite socials at the Fan Upstate. Mark, you tasked me with coming up with the list of conference champions, and your you regular season conference champions. Yes, it took 15 minutes. This should not take this long. It should not take this long, but a huge number of conference champions did not get into the NCAA tournament. We're talking about regular season conference champions, full body of work. You did everything you needed to do over a regular season. Most of these teams are playing what? 25 regular season yeah, games. Diesel, ish? Science tells us that the greater the sample size, the more accurate the result. Right? Sure. So which is a more accurate barometer of who the best team of each conference is, who the best team is after four months or who the best team is after four days, right? Obviously the champion of four months is a better barometer of who the better team is than a champion of four days, especially when you never play games in back-to-back days, essentially, over the course of the season. And if you do play like a a tournament at the beginning of the year where you play a couple games back-to-back, you certainly don't play three days in a row, four days in a row. NC State won the ACC over the weekend, playing not one, not two, not three, not four, but five days in a row. So, you know, spare me, guys, all of the bubble talk about the bubble teams that got screwed. Spare me Oklahoma. Diesel, I'm looking at a Yahoo Sports article right now that says Oklahoma is the most screwed over team. Listen to this, Diesel. They were 8-10 and in the Big 12. No, thank you. No, thank you. You know, like, you should be able to have a winning record in your conference in order to make the tournament. No, thank you. They say the second most screwed team is Seton Hall. Third is Indiana State. Fourth is Pittsburgh. Five is St. John's. And six is Providence. You know who the most screwed teams are that didn't make the tournament? Those who won their conference in the regular season, lost their conference tournament, and don't get to go dancing. Because those conferences are not sending their best team to the tournament. Diesel, 
Without further ado, here are the teams whose bubbles really burst. They were the best their conference had to offer over the whole season, four months, and yet they were supplanted by what happened in four days. What do we got? 15, 15 teams won their regular season, but didn't get into the NCAA. Wow. 15 teams. Now, you caught me in the middle of trying to compile all of their records, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a little bit clunky here. But these 15 teams and their records, the NCAA tournament said, nah, not interested in you guys. Sit down, go home, go play in the NIT. And every in the CBA, we don't care. And every single one of these, and every single one of these teams won their conference yep. in the regular season. Yep. So here we go down the list of teams that were left out of the NCAA tournament who did in fact win their regular season in their conferences. From the Atlantic Sun, Eastern Kentucky, who had an overall record of 17 and 14. No, it's not that egregious that they didn't get in there. Not a 21 team. But they were 12 and 4 in their conference. That's true. That's true. They were just not good out of conference. South Florida went 24 and 7 on the season. Uh, they are out. They went 16 and 2 diesel in their conference. Who went from that league? Uh, UAB. UAB. UAB went from that league. Loyola of Chicago, 23 and 9, were out. Out from the Big Sky. Wait, 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 wait. One second. Is one second. From the A10, guess who else was out? The Richmond Spiders. So that might be 16 diesel. Okay. I don't. Richmond also lost. So I'm, I got the standings up right now. Richmond lost. Loyola of Chicago lost. Duquesne went from that league. So 15 and 3. Think about this, guys. The Atlantic 10 is a good basketball conference. Two teams that were 15 and three in the Atlantic 10, okay, didn't go to the tournament because the sixth seed in the tournament won. Make it make sense. Yep. Picking back up here with the, let's see, the Big Sky, Eastern Washington, with 21 and 11. They're out. From the Big South, High Point, went 25 and eight. They're out. From the Big West, UC Irvine went 24 and 9. They are out. From Conference USA, Sam Houston went 21 and 12. They are out. From the Ivy League, Princeton went 24 and 4. They are out. From the Metro Atlantic Conference, Quinnipiac went 24 and 9. They are out. From the Mid American Conference, Toledo, 20 and 11 for the fourth year in a row. For the fourth year in a row, they win their conference, 20 and 11 overall. They are out. Oh. From the Mid Eastern Conference, Norfolk State, 22 and 11. They are out. From the Missouri Valley Conference, and this hurts a lot of people's hearts, Indiana State and Kareem Abdul Jabbar, 28 and 6. Out. Now we we are of course a call the guy's last name is Avilas, but people call him Cream Abdul Jabbar, not Kareem, but Cream, as in the cream that you put in your coffee. Okay, we'll let you guys figure that out. They're calling him Cream Abdul Jabbar, Indiana State. Everyone was so excited about seeing this guy because he's kind of pudgy, looks unathletic, but just balls, right? And has the Kareem Abdul Jabbar goggles. Diesel, I will supplant, I will supplement this with their conference record. Indiana State was 17 and 3 in their conference. But because I guess Drake won the uh, conference tournament, Indiana State doesn't go. Heartbreaker. Yep. Uh, let's see here. Central Connecticut out of the Northeast Conference, 20 and 11 overall. They were 13 and 3 in their conference, Diesel. From uh, the Southwestern Conference, Grambling State went 20 and 14 overall. They are out. From the Southwestern Conference, Grambling State. Uh, I'm sorry, what conference was that, Diesel? Southwestern. Southwestern. Grambling is in. Oh, Grambling is in. Grambling is in. Yeah, Grambling is in. Uh, uh, that's okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. From the Sun Belt, App State went 27 and 6. Ugh. Ugh. They were 16 and 2 in their conference. 16 and 2. You got a 16 and 2 conference team. Oh, sorry, you guys aren't good enough. You're not good enough. By the way, why do you, why do we think all these teams are turning down NIT berths? Like, what's up with that? You know, a bunch of teams are saying we're not going to play in a non-NCAA sanctioned event. You have every year. 
you have every year. St. John said today they're not going to play in the NIT. We're not playing in the not in tournament. You know what? That's a reflection of folks, just a societal change that like, you know, things like that are not worth our time anymore. Right. Well, they also uh, changed the rules. The NIT changed some of their selection rules. And they said that, that no longer are regular season conference champions automatically in the NIT. And they made some other rules changes as well. But St. John's, Pittsburgh, Oklahoma, Memphis, Ole Miss, and Indiana all rejected NIT invitations. And uh, James Madison out of the Sun Belt never, never uh, wants to shy away from an opportunity to put your names out there. They got into the NCAA tournament by virtue of winning the Sun Belt tournament. They also announced that they would not be uh, accepting any future invitations into non-NCAA sanctioned events. So I, I thought I think this too is interesting, Diesel. Like Deuce Poppy too on Twitter says to me, Mark, rankings have zero to do with the seedings. Not true, Deuce Poppy. Um, there are two different groups that do rankings. Okay, two different groups that do rankings. The selection committee has their rankings, and the AP poll and coaches have their rankings. Okay, well, three different groups, right? You got the AP poll, you got the coaches in their poll, and then you have the selection committee. The selection committee has rankings for all these teams. Teams ranked one through four all get one seeds. Five through eight get two seeds. Nine through 12 get three seeds, right? And so on. They have rankings for all of these teams. They do. Um, And so it's just weird. It's kooky when you say, and you know what I think happens quite honestly, they've got the bracket done. They don't feel like going back and screwing up a lot of stuff. Remember the rules in the bracket are that you cannot have two teams from the same conference play each other before when? Before the Sweet 16. So you got everyone perfectly matched up in the bracket, and these guys who are making the bracket, the selection committee, they don't want to go back in and move Florida up a lot. They don't want to do that. That screws up. Okay, no, no, no. We, we've got it right now. They can't play anyone from the SEC until the Sweet 16. That's what really is at play here. But Auburn, according to anybody, anybody is not between the 13th and 16th best team in the country. Auburn's number seven, bro. They're number seven. The selection committee just said they're between 13th and 16th. Give me a freaking break. You have got to be kidding me about this, man. This makes absolutely, positively no sense whatsoever. But again, I feel like those teams that were screwed the most are not those whose bubble burst. Rather, it's those teams who won their conference over the regular season. Diesel, great job on the research, went through every single one of them and had kick-ass records, 17-3, 16-2 conference records, only to not be permitted to the dance. That's the problem. You talk to Bob Ritchie, that's Bob Ritchie's problem. Bob Ritchie's problem is that the conference, the regular season champion, doesn't make it to the tournament. All right, guys. If there is a team that's going to prevent Kansas City from three-peating this year, who is it going to be? What would you say if uh, we had a chance to bring you our interview with Mark Schlereth, Odyssey NFL insider, Fox Sports NFL analyst, and we'll do so next. You're listening to the most interactive sports talk show anywhere. It's Offsides, Mark Ryan and Diesel, and we are the Fan Up State. Scratch your head a bit. I think my favorite right now is Derrick Henry to Baltimore. If that guy's healthy, it's a 2,000 yard season for him. With what Lamar does on the wow. edge, the way he, the way he, uh, you know, the way he holds the defense, you know, he's such a threat off the 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 run option stuff, you know, off the um, off the zone read stuff. He's such a threat that your defense never constricts. So you hold the backside safety, you hold the backside linebacker, you hold the entirety of the backside defensive end. So you hold 
that whole position. And it creates, when you get that little cutback scene, there's nobody really pressing because they're so threatened by Lamar holding that ball. So that to me is like just a huge, um, that's a huge one. And then ultimately, you know, I think everybody's talking about just the lack of, just the lack of activity of Dallas Cowboys. And, you know, maybe that's just one of those things. And I'll tell you, free agency is interesting to me because you're playing a, you're paying a plus money for B plus talent in most situations. So it is a situ, it is a, a interesting situation, but you know, Dallas getting bounced in that first round. And I think receiving wise, you know, CD lamb is a great player, but I think there's some question marks about Dallas and kind of what they're doing from that aspect. Mark Schlereth joining us here on CBS Sports Radio. Mark, can you bring us into your own history as a free agent? What was that like? Did you, did you enjoy the flirtation? Uh, was it stressful to you? Well, yeah, it was stressful to me. Well, one, you know, it was one of those situations where, you know, when you get told by the team that you play for that they're no longer interested in you, yeah, um, then then it becomes, you know, personal. And... And, you know, you get all those, hey, man, you're a warrior. You're just unbelievable. What you do for us is incredible. You're playing injured. You're all that, this, that, and the other. Hey, you know, you're not really playing as well as you were at one point, so we really don't want you anymore. Like, that's, that's a tough pill to swallow, and it's one of those things that's tough to hear. But it's also, a, it's also a great thing, right? Like, at least I know where I stand. You know, when all of a sudden I became a hot free agent, you know, candidate, then all of a sudden that team, which was Washington Redskins at the time, changed their tune. You know, we, we'd like to match any offer. I'm like Tom Sands. You've already stated how you felt, so I'm done with you guys. But it was stressful in that I kept plunking physicals. Um, even at that point, I had had so many surgeries that I couldn't pass the physical. And so uh, I flunked a physical in uh, Chicago. I flunked one in Indianapolis. I flunked one in Atlanta. And, um, and really, the only reason I passed in Denver was because Coach Alex Gibbs really wanted me and told Mike he didn't care if I couldn't pass the physical. He wanted to coach me. And so Mike Shanahan said, all right, we're done. That's, that's it. And I uh, always say, and every time I see Mike, and Mike and I are good friends now, and he's been a mentor to me, and I'm over at his house studying film and looking at stuff all the time, um, studying the history of the game and kind of studying the global complexity of the game. Um, I owe him a debt of gratitude because, um, man, he managed my career where I would take, you know, maybe six, seven plays to practice that we needed to see. And beyond that, man, he just really managed me and helped me and um, kept me in the league probably a lot longer than I should have been in the league based on my injury history. Who is the very best player on the offensive line that you study today in today's game, Mark? Well, Kelsey, who just retired, is is a phenomenal player. Um, he's one of my favorites to watch. Trent Williams is an absolute beast. And I love watching Trent Williams because he just tries to murder people. And like he does not care if he misses a block, he doesn't. Get, he doesn't, he's just trying to shorten your neck and essentially rip your head off. So he's a guy I love watching play. Lane Johnson technically is just a really fun player for me to watch. A really really good player. Um, there's just so there's just so many guys that I just uh, I become enamored by, and I can't. Like I'm like off the top of my head, those are just a couple of guys I love to watch play. Um, there's a there's a bunch there's a bunch of other guys that I think are a lot of fun to watch and that absolutely dominate the line of scrimmage. So um, those dudes, you know, because there's no, I mean, you think about it, we're, it's the it's the toughest position in football to play, and I know everybody gets all enamored by the quarterback, but I'll just leave you with this. I'll, I'll give you a thought here. Um, you know, we are collectively the worst athletes on a football team by far. And every time we line up against somebody, that guy has a physical advantage from an athleticism standpoint. And yet our job is to block that guy 100% of the time. If we give up one sack in that afternoon, that guy goes to the Pro Bowl and you're a piece of garbage. And so, I mean, name one other position where the lesser athlete is expected to win 100% of the battles or where unlike athletes match up. And it, it just doesn't happen. I mean, edge players right now are running four three eights. Uh, it, the, the game is crazy that way. And, um, and you know, that, that position, there's, I always say there's no greater skill than playing offensive line, no greater skill than moving a guy from point A to point B against his will 
who's every bit as big as you, every bit as strong as you, but is a better athlete than you. Mark Schlereth, Odyssey NFL insider, phenomenal NFL analyst, three-time Super Bowl champion, joining us here on CBS Sports Radio. Mark, you were privy to a lot of the off-the-field stuff, and I know you didn't mention that. You kept it on the field uh, about the, your critique of him. But I, I've been watching some of this Caleb Williams stuff and not revealing the medical records and not going to Chicago to visit when they wanted him to go to visit. In, in that respect, has anything you've heard about Caleb Williams given you pause if you held the number one overall pick? Yeah, I think, it, I think it would give me pause. But, again, your job is to maximize your value. And, you know, and it, it's like there's part of me that just goes, really, this guy? You know, I, you can miss me with this guy. But then there's part of me that goes, I respect it. You know, I mean, I respect the fact that, hey, do you guys want me? Come get me. But I'm not just going to make it easy on you guys. And I'll tell you the other thing that always drives, drives me crazy. And, you know, I don't know what our Players Association does, pretty much nothing. But it drives me crazy when I think that when I think that these guys, um, you, know, you take these Wonderlick tests and you have a bad Wonderlick test, that, that's privileged information. And it always gets leaked. Why does it get leaked? Because NFL teams want to besmirch you and drop your value so they can get you at a lesser pick. And I look at that and go, well, you know, good for Caleb Williams. Pound on you guys. You know, I'm not going to let you use stuff against me. Either draft me off the tape or don't draft me off the tape. And so there's part of me that, that says, hey, man, you don't have leverage very often when you're an NFL player. And when you have the hammer, swing that damn thing because you won't you may never have it again. So uh, use that leverage. Swing that hammer. Calling a game or playing in a game, which, which have you enjoyed more, Mark? Oh, playing. But I love calling them. They're, they're fun. It's the closest thing you can get to, to playing in a game. You know, you just get done at the end of the day and you're not beat to a pulp. <laughs> Player you hated going against? Um, there's a couple guys that, that gave me fits, and it's not the guys you would think. We always had good games against guys who were all pro type of players. Um, a guy by the name of Pierce Holt gave me fits. Um, a guy by the name of Phil Hansen gave me fits. A um, couple of, you know, backup. The guys that, that I hated playing against were the guys that were fairly gelatinous, that you never felt like you'd get your hands on those guys. Those are the ones, you know, like there's nobody that could play the power game with me. I was, you know, I'm the strongest human on the planet. So um, that, I, I wanted you to run into me. I wanted you to try to go physical toe-to-toe with me because that was my game and I beat the snot out of you. But it was those little – it was the smaller guys that were just hard to get your hands on. Because if I get my hands on you, you know, my thought process is if I get my hands on you, you're done. Mark, I saw you had a tweet this week, and I love that you engage with uh, fans from all over. That's awesome. But you, you tweeted, bet, I, I, but I bet you can't find one other guy who started for 12 seasons and started in three Super Bowls and played in multiple Pro Bowls while having 29 surgeries. 29, 15 on your left knee, and in 20 years, I'll still be remembered by the people that matter. And Mark, you know, like, I had my gallbladder removed in 2019. I said I can never go through surgery again, okay? Like, uh, it was just just what it did to my body. Like, it just, I didn't feel like myself for a month. Like, yeah. mentally, how did you go through that 29 times? Um, you know, it's, I guess it's just what you do. Um. You know, I was a football player, and that came with it. There's always going to be sacrifice, and I got to live out a childhood dream. And so I knew that there was going to be sacrifice that was involved in that. And so that was just part of my journey. And, you know, I always looked at it like a, like a, you know, it was a, it was my duty to go out there and put others ahead of myself and to play hurt, to play injured, more importantly, to play well hurt and injured. And I always felt like that was my, kind of my duty. And so I always, you know, I always had a lot of pride in that and always had a lot of pride showing up and playing. And like I said, and playing well under those circumstances. So um, that was just the way I was wired. And it was, there was a battle, you know, not only a battle of me against the guy I had to play against, but there was also this battle against me against me. 
you know, I feel like garbage. My knee is killing me. I just had a surgery, you know, four days ago. Uh, whether it was an elbow surgery, I had a, a kidney uh, operation on a Sunday night. Checked myself out of the hospital Monday morning and played Monday night and beat the Raiders 27 nothing. So um, that that was a it was always a you know a, just a, a battle within a battle and something that I took a lot of pride in being able to do. Incredible. Mark, you don't know this about me, but uh, I have been an orderer of uh, stinking good chili. And oh, it is some I... of the best chili that I've ever had in my life. Uh, now, I don't expect you to give any of your secrets away here here on the air. But uh, what can you tell us about stinking good chili and what makes it so stinking good? Uh, probably the salt. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it is delicious. And it's... Uh... You know, it's a, it's my buddy's recipe. I don't even know the recipe, but uh, we started this labor of love 15 years ago, and we're still, that's almost 17 years ago, I guess. We're still plugging away, slowly but surely. But, uh, yeah, it's been this labor of love, and it's been a lot of fun. And uh, I always joke around, had I known then what I know now about the food business, I'd have picked something else to invest in. But uh, we've had a great time doing it, and uh, we just continue to plug away. It's stinking good chili, folks. Trust me. Trust me. Order it now. Thank me later. Three-time Super Bowl champion, two-time pro bowler, and one of the best darn NFL analysts in the business. Whenever I hear the voice, I know I'm in for a good time for the next three hours. Mark Schlereth. Mark, thoroughly enjoyed the conversation, man. Thanks so much for making the time. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Make sure you check out that Stinking Truth podcast on Odyssey, also on YouTube. Stinking Truth. You can just look it up there. it's offsides mark ryan and diesel we are the fan upstate what'd you think of that interview mark schlereth heard right here on the fan upstate and on cbs sports radio over the weekend great to have you guys with us man do truly appreciate you uh let's see here texter says i think brad brunell will be at clemson at least three more seasons how about that? Three more seasons for Brad Brown. La 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 la. Um, guys, I want to bring. I want to uh, have this kind of debate with you. Okay, bring into this conversation. Uh, we've been all brackets all the time. A little bit, a little NFL mixed in in the first hour and twenty minutes of the show today. Can I? Uh, can I just say this? You know, um, anyone who has more than one bracket is a loser. Okay. Anyone that has more than one bracket is a loser. It's called hedging your bets and saying, look, I got it more right on one of these brackets. Stop doing that, okay? Don't be a loser. Have one bracket. Kick ass at your one bracket. Be great at your one bracket. And own your one bracket, okay? There is no, oh, I got this in this bracket and this in the other bracket. This isn't a fantasy league, ladies and gentlemen. Okay? This is your bracket. I'm tired of hearing, like, if, if I hear anybody say, I got them in this bracket and them in this, I'm like, you don't know what you think then. You don't know what you think. You don't know what you believe. All right? So What do you want? That's it. That's so, all we're asking notebook. here. So, guys, let us establish what is good okay what is good among uh, among the criteria okay um 75% of the first round if you win it that's good okay that's good that would be you go 24 and 8 in the first round with your picks that's good all right if you can have more than 8 of the sweet 16 so 9 or more of the sweet 16 that's good Okay, you are doing a nice job. You're doing very, very well. People always say, well, what's good? Here's what I have. My, you know, my bracket's a mess. My bracket's busted. 
guys, I at uh, at a job at a media company, I once, okay, uh, lost my national champion on the first day of the tournament. Michigan State was my national championship pick. They lost, and I won the pool of all the guys at work. Okay, lost my national championship first first day. Ended up getting three hundred and fifty bucks. All right, I'll take it, and it was awesome. So, you know, guys, like you can't put too much into what happens, but I do think there are general rules that you can, you can abide by. Okay. You win 24 games in the first round out of 32 games. You've done well. You get more than half of the sweet 16 teams. You've done well. You have just one bracket, not multiple brackets. Okay. You've done well. These, these, these are hallmarks of, uh, of what you need to do to do well. I also think diesel you need to pick at least one 12 seed because 75% of the years, a 12 seed beats a five seed. So who is your 12 seed this year? That's the million dollar question. Yes, Jason. Uh, last year, I did really well in my first and second rounds. You know, something in the range of, like you said, 24, 25 correct picks in the first round. Felt really good about that. And then it went in the second round. I mean, it, it you know, it's like Amelia Earhart into the ocean. Ugh. It did not go well in the second and third rounds of that tournament. Yeah, and you know what, man? Uh, I, I was looking at this and uh, thinking to myself, um, you know, like I, I like it's it's crazy to me when you consider just how many teams are in this thing that have a chance to really do something, really pull an upset uh, in this tournament. Seven one three zero seven on the text line is where you can get to us on the show, guys. I, I've got a theory that um, you know maybe the upstate isn't that into March Madness. I told you, you know, this was a debate inside our offices here okay um we've seen it or i should say we haven't seen it this is the first year since i've been here that we are not carrying the tournament it's the first year since i've been here not carrying the tournament um and i'll be honest with you i was surprised to learn that but when i did a little bit more thinking on it i understood the why okay i understood the why do you know uh, among all the shows we do over the course of the entire season, do you know what month more than any other month is the slowest traffic month for engagement here at the Fan Upstate? It's this one. What's going on in this month? You know, in February, you have football just ended, Super Bowl just ended. You know, the, the football crowd is still kind of hanging around. In March, March might, might as well be in the Upstate, the dog days of summer, man. Because, you know, at least in the summertime, June, July, and August, you have the football hype train building, right? You're building to the hype of that glorious moment when toe meets leather in September. But in March, it's like, okay, I fully realize that football's over. And what you guys have told us is you're not really into college basketball. You're not really that into it. So my thing is, Diesel, is it because it, the chicken and the egg, right? Is it because they've the teams here have sucked over the course of the year. Is that why people are not into it? Or is it just largely that the market, the upstate, is not that into it? Last thing I'll say on this, um, there was a year ago, okay, like I, 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 looked at the, um, I looked at the text line one day, a year ago, and it was when March Madness was going. I think it was the second day of March Madness. And I remember saying to myself, I don't think I can remember a single day where both shows combined for fewer text messages. And what did we do all that day? What did we do the whole day? It was all the tournament. It was all bracket stuff. And, you know, like I'm not, I'm not in the business of dogging us, you know, like our show didn't get a lot of texts. The Rob Brown show didn't get a lot of texts. It was the same day of show. And I'm like, wow. Then this very next year, we're doing live shows. We're not, we're not carrying the tournament. Okay. So like the way our management looks at it is we're going to do better than carry the tournament. We're going to, we're going to have live shows on. We're going to have live shows on three to 7 PM. Diesel, when I see that engagement or lack thereof, it's hard to argue with a decision management made. And it just makes me wonder again, the chicken and the egg, is it, is it that you just don't like basketball or is it that your teams have sucked and given you nothing to cheer about? Which well, is it? Well, we're going to find out the answer to this question because I just put up a poll at the Fan Upstate on Twitter. A scale of one to four, because it only gives you four options when you put up a poll. 
Uh, how into the NCAA tournament are you? Choices are easy. One through four. Number one, not into it at all. Number two, I'm a little bit into it. Number three, I'm pretty into it. And number four, I'm 100% locked in. And so I just put up the poll. Let's start getting some results in there. Everybody who's watching on the stream, Spur Daddy, Madcraft. Uh, I think I saw J.D. Wyatt in here a while ago. All of you, please jump on the Fan Upstate's Twitter and vote in the poll. And everybody listening, jump on the Fan Upstate's Twitter and vote on the poll. And if you haven't, make sure you hit follow. Why do you guys think that is that, um, you know, like we've had some of our lowest engagement for the year in the month of March? You know, because I value constructive feedback. If there's something we're not doing in March that we should be doing in March, I'd like to know what it is. I would. OK. At the same time, like last year, it was like the, fr the first Friday of the tournament. So the second day of the tournament. And I remember looking at the number of texts that our show got, the Rob Brown show got, and I remember thinking to myself, I don't think like we've ever had a day that cumulatively had this few texts between both shows, you know, um, like w we've seen this text line blow up and grow and calls increase and Facebook messages increase and the growth has been awesome. And I just said to myself, huh, is the upstate just not into March Madness? Are they just not into March Madness? What do you guys think? 71307, do you think so guys think South Carolina and Clemson make it out of the first round? No to Clemson, yes to South Carolina. Uh, What's up to Henny Billums at Down Bad Bad on Twitter? Says he just followed the fan upstate on Twitter and he said, did this for Diesel. Thank you, Henny Billums. Great to have you guys with us, man. Truly do appreciate it. All right, my friends. Coming up next on the show, our good buddy, Chris Phillips, joins us. What does he make of South Carolina's draw, Clemson's chances, so much more? Three teams from the Palmetto State in March Madness for the first time in over 20 years. That's next. This is the most interactive sports talk show anywhere. It's Offsides, Mark Ryan and Diesel. We are the Fan Up State. It's offsides, Mark Ryan and Diesel. We are the Fan Up State rolling on until 7 o'clock p.m. today. Thrilled to have you guys with us as, uh, as we roll on, man, on a... Monday edition of the show, jam-packed as is always the case, my friends, and uh, always thrilled to have you guys with us. How about uh, the story of it? Did you guys hear the story of Kenny Pickett over the weekend? Was so bent, apparently, at the treasonous Pittsburgh Steelers for wanting a better quarterback than one Kenny Pickett and demanded to be traded. So Pittsburgh said, cool, man. We will keep you in the state, okay? We will keep you in the state, and you're going to go to a worse situation than where you are now, okay? You're not going to a better situation. You're going to a worse situation. And where did they send them? They sent them to the Philadelphia Eagles, sent them to the Philadelphia Eagles, where he's going to now back up Chris uh, Jalen Hurts. Jalen Hurts. How about that? And by the way, why should why should he um, be crowned or grandfathered into the starting role in, uh, in in Pittsburgh? Do you know in his career, Kenny Pickett has 13 touchdown passes and 13 picks in his career. Do you know that in Russell Wilson's worst season of his career, worst season, Russell Wilson? has 14 had 14 touchdown passes. Kenny Pickett for his career, 13 touchdown passes, 13 picks. They got him they 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 shipped him out for like a 6th round pick 
That was a first round pick bust. Justin Fields was a first round pick bust, unfortunately, because they got a sixth round pick in exchange for him. There's some relatively good quarterbacks that are getting shipped out for a bag of potato chips right now, man. And let me tell you, that is something else. That is really, really, really something else. Okay, we are chasing uh, Chris Phillips. If you see Chris Phillips out and about, let him know that uh, that we are most certainly looking for him. Uh, guys, I also uh, did this little research project over the weekend. You know, I was I was thinking about Kirk Cousins and Russell Wilson uh, that uh, are traded at the age of 35. <coughs> They're going to be 36. Russell Wilson's going to be 36 in the regular season. Kirk Cousins is going to turn 36 in August before uh, the regular season kicks off. Okay. And so I was looking at this and I said to myself, I don't know what these guys, man, I don't know. Are they too old to really make a difference? Everybody's got an opinion on that, right? But what I wanted to do was I wanted to take a look at the data. Let's look at the data. What does the data say? And here's what surprised me about this. Here's what surprised me. Um, when, when you go through the different names, the Peyton Mannings, the Tom Brady's of the world, the Matt Stafford's of the world, right? The Joe Montana's of the world. So many of these guys changed places, old faces and new places late in their career. And by golly, did not almost every single one of these things work out? Did not only single, did not, every single one of these things worked out? Diesel, I'm told that he's ready right now. Um, but, uh, you know, Peyton Manning won a Super Bowl with Denver. Joe Montana went to the AFC Championship game, went to an AFC Championship game with the Kansas City Chiefs. Tom Brady won a Super Bowl with Tampa Bay. Um, the, you know, the, the, the the back and forth between these guys and and what the results that we've seen are actually really really positive so that that says a lot for Kirk Cousins and Russell Wilson in terms of what they just might be able to do what do you say joining us right now on the show is the host founder of SEC Unfiltered he goes by the name of Chris Phillips and he joins us right now on the line Chris, always great to have you on, man. I do appreciate you. Chris, um, you know, we are always in a mode here on the Fan Upstate of self-reflection. And a year ago, Chris, I noticed that we got some of our lowest engagement days of the year surrounding the tournament. And it's easy to say, well, Mark, people are watching the tournament. But what about the days leading up to the tournament? And, you know, it's our job to have a finger on the pulse of what people care about. Are people just out on college basketball, man? Or like, what's what's the deal? Um, we typically get some of our lowest engagement days of the year when the tournament is going on. And I think in part that resulted in uh, us not carrying the tournament for the first time ever this year. We're not carrying it, Chris. We got live shows on. Um, and based on the engagement or lack thereof I've seen, I think management made a good call here. I mean, Mark, these are first things first. Appreciate you having me on. I know it sounds like I'm at a party right now, but I think the folks here care about the tournament. Um, no, I mean, I, I think obviously last year, you know, you look at the landscape of college basketball in the Palmetto State and, you know, the way the teams fared. And, you know, if you're not excited about the tournament, Mark, I, I don't know what to tell you. I've never been more fired up for March Madness in quite some time. You know what I mean? It's It's been a while. 2017 was a long time ago when South kind of went to the Final Four. And I think I heard you say last week the first time since – what, 97, 98, that both South Carolina and Clemson are both in the postseason. So, I mean, it's – I don't know if folks around here aren't fired up for the tournament, but, I mean, I, everybody I've talked to seems like they're elated. Um, you know, I, I'm excited for the women's tournament, too. I mean, I think there's going to be a lot of great basketball. So, you know, most of the folks I talk to are ready to go and fired up, and certainly we are. Tons of content. we got eight SEC teams in the NCAA tournament, the men's side of things, and, of course, the women well represented as well. So, we're fired up. Chris, what has the better odds? South Carolina men advancing to the Sweet 16, so that's two wins, or the South Carolina women winning the whole thing? 
I would probably say the women winning the whole thing. I, I just think the gap between them and the second best team is pretty wide. I think it's a sizable margin. I mean, I know there's, you know, LSU, there's obviously Iowa with Kay- Caitlin Clark who knocked them out a, a season ago, but you got to remember guys. I mean, it took what I would call a, a legendary performance from Caitlin Clark to knock them out. So, and I, and I think it's actually LSU and Iowa, I believe are in the same region or they're going to meet up before the national title, or even the final four. So I mean, I would still say South Carolina women winning it all. Those are pretty likely odds. I'd have to imagine there's a minus in front of that number. I think with the Gamecock men, not to say they can't get to the Sweet 16, but I just think with the parity in men's college basketball, you just never know what might happen. I mean, heck, I think they drew one of the tougher first-round matchups when you talk about the Oregon Ducks and, and former Gamecock Jermaine Cousnard and, you know, the challenges that team presents with their size and their physicality. But, uh, boy, the South Carolina women sure do seem like a sure bet. I'm not trying to jinx them, but – they seem sure as ever for sure this year. We've got Chris Phillips joining us here. Offsides, Mark Ryan and Diesel. We are the Fan Up State. Chris, it seems to me like, I don't know if you thought this, but I kind of felt like based on all that we heard about the dominance of the SEC, that the SEC kind of got seeding screwed in this tournament. Auburn, a four seed, when they're the number seven team in the polls. I mean, you know, the, the selection committee has their own ranking system. But what are they watching if they say Auburn is between the 13th and the 16th best team in America when the AP poll and the coaches poll have them number seven? Jimmy Dyke said yesterday Florida's going to be a five seed. Florida's a seven seed. Uh, I think South Carolina should be at least two seed lines higher than Clemson. What, what gives there? Yeah, it's, it's perplexing, Mark, to say the least. You know, I, I think with Auburn, you make a great point, especially after the one the SEC tournament. I was surprised Tennessee wasn't a one seed. I know they went out early in Nashville and it upset, but I, I thought they did enough, you know, with the resume to earn that. Um, you know, it's funny. The net rankings, again, guys, are kind of like that thing. It's like whose line is it anyway? Where we're just kind of making it up as we go along. The points don't matter. And I, I don't know. It's, you know. South Carolina, certainly Gamecock fans were griping about the net rankings. Obviously, you guys asked me many times what gives. And, I, you know, I, I think there are folks out there, thankfully, smarter than me that give you a good answer. But it, it, it is – it's weird to think how, you know, the, the, the computers come up with the numbers and the efficiency ratings and all that. I mean, I, I think we've all watched college basketball with our own two eyes, and we saw what Auburn did in the SEC tournament. We know when they're clicking they're one of the best in college basketball. So – I definitely thought they were underseeded. I mean, I don't think they really care, guys. I mean, again, it's, it's great to have a higher seed, but I mean, hey, this is where the real season begins, right? I mean, this is why March Madness, we put such an emphasis on it because now it's a new season. Everybody's got a shot. And, um, but certainly there were some questionable seedings. Hey, the Florida Gators, you mentioned too, Mark. So, and uh, great run by Florida, by the way. I thought they were wildly impressive in Nashville. Chris, you know, we were uh, talking earlier, Mark and I, off the air about just some of the weird seeding situations. You know, you got you got Virginia, who was a, a, a last four in, who are playing into a 10 seed spot, which seems like, you know, an awful lot of help for a team there that uh, that necessarily didn't earn it. You also look at an FAU who didn't have a particularly great season, but they got seeded as high as an eight, which I, I think is, is a well over seed. You know, it, it seems obviously that the NCAA, the, the selection committee, is kind of doing the old-fashioned helmet scouting thing. Were you as bent about some of the seedings as a lot of people were, or do you kind of uh, subscribe to the notion of, all right, you're in the tournament, just shut up and go play? Uh, yeah, I'm kind of in the middle. I mean, I, I think some folks certainly Diesel have a gripe. I'm, I'm not going to say that some of these teams don't, but to your point, it's like, hey, you're in. Let's go ball out. You know, you want to go prove people wrong. Now's the opportunity to do so. So, I mean, once you're in, you're in. And I, I think certainly, like you mentioned, the helmet scouting. And, it's you know, a lot of – heck, we've seen it with South Carolina this year. Why were they disrespected? Why were they undervalued? I mean, it's got a lot to do with the name on the jersey and the brand and, and the colors and how well have you done previously. And, you know, it's why we thought about before. I mean, I think for South Carolina, you don't write off their season if they don't – um, you know, make a run in March Madness, but certainly, you know, it's going to go a long way in regards to getting garnering national respect, uh, how you fare in a tournament. So, you know, I, I think it's one of those things, guys, that I, I think you can get upset about it or kick and scream for a moment or two, but I think then you kind of sit back and realize, hey, it's a blessing my team is in the tournament and uh, they got an opportunity to do something that maybe they don't get to do every year. And, and that alone in itself is great. So you just kind of – listen, you just kind of beat who's ahead of you. You know, you just go play, and, and uh, I don't mean to give, like, the coach speak answer, but that's really just it, man. I think 
you know, as a fan, if you're exhausting energy over, well, we should have been a six and we're a seven. Well, who cares? Go prove them wrong and go win anyways. Chris Phillips joining us here on the show. Chris, what is Lamont Paris doing that Shane Beamer isn't in, early in his tenure at South Carolina? Did, you know, did, did, I, did I hear you laugh at that? That's a, you're you're well, laughing at my I, questions I, now, Chris. This is this is I'm not good for us. Because people are, I see people always bring it up that Mark's always going to find a way to bring Shane Beamer into it somehow. Oh, so. That's right. That's uh, right. Well, you know, you know what it is, Chris. Honestly, uh, I'll bring I'll bring you into this. Um, it's yeah. that I have a goal every single show to do something Clemson and South Carolina football related, right? And so, like I've like that's been like part of a picture of success for us here. So like, it's not easy to find anything football related to talk about right now. Clemson and South Carolina, you got spring ball, you got like, who are the stars of tomorrow? You got players on the spot. We, we, you've got best and worst case scenarios for Clemson. We've done all that stuff, you know? So it's kind of like I, every day I'm thinking to myself, how can I bring Clemson and South Carolina football in, into the show? And, you know, I'm thinking to myself, okay, Lamont Paris objectively is doing a better job, has been more impressive than Shane Beamer has, right? So that that, that brings in my question to you. Like, Chris, it's like yeah. one guy is an A, another guy is a C. That's not hate. It's it's reality, right? Why is Lamont Paris an A and Beamer is a C? What's missing? Well, I mean, I think the first thing that's very obvious that jumps out in my opinion, Mark, is that, you know, it, it's, a, it's a smaller sample size, only by one year, though, to be fair. So... Um, but I think Lamont Paris in a shorter amount of time has had more hits from the transfer portal, period, point blank. It's not just about, you know, getting people from the portal. It's landing people and hitting on them to the point to where you're landing contributors, right? You're not just landing bodies to fill a jersey. So I think that's what Lamont Paris – I mean, that's, that's why you're seeing this turnaround, guys. Um, I mean, the only other thing I can really think of, I can cite for sure, that I know Lamont Paris is doing that Shane Beamer's not is – or maybe that Lamont Paris isn't doing. I haven't seen Lamont make any headlines in any press conferences. I, I haven't seen him go viral on social media for any reason. Um, you know, fairly or unfairly, some folks won't like hearing that. I mean, it just is what it is. It's just a fact. So, um, you know, I think Lamont Paris in times of adversity has put his head down and, and, and led from the front, which is what great leaders did. And he hasn't blamed circumstance. He hasn't blamed situation. He just went out there and put in the work and, out of the pieces they've needed, and and that's why you're seeing the results. So I know Gamecock fans are obviously hoping Shane Beamer is going to sort of morph and evolve into that guy. And I'm not saying he hasn't been resilient. I'm not saying he hasn't, um, you know, been able to fight through adversity. But I think there's times certainly where I think fans would have preferred Beamer taking the more stoic, quiet approach and just handle business behind closed doors and maybe not had – maybe had – the logical response versus the emotional response. I think Lamont Paris has done a good job of that. Chris, South Carolina baseball sitting at 15 and five right now through 20 games. Uh, is, is the program, the team right now behind ahead of, or right where you thought they'd be through 20 games. And at the end of the season, will Gamecock fans still be calling for Mark Kingston's job? I think they're slightly behind, admittedly, Diesel. You know, I, I had realistic expectations for South Carolina baseball. I did. I mean, I picked them to finish fourth in the SEC East. And when I say that, guys, we all know how loaded the SEC is. So I, I didn't think South Carolina was going to be a, a bad club by any means. And, and I still don't expect that. I think they're going to be right at a 15-15 a and 15 SEC team, maybe 16-14, and 14, which, you know, I know that sounds crazy, but it's, it's actually really, really good in the SEC when you consider how deep the league is. Like, if you go 500 in the SEC, you're a really, really good ball club that's probably going to make some noise in the postseason. Now, the common fan or just those out there that saw last year and don't follow college baseball as closely, I mean, I think they had much, much higher expectations than did I. But even with that, I think South Carolina is slightly behind. I didn't expect them to not win a single game against Clemson, and I certainly didn't think they were going to lose two of three to the Ole Miss Rebels, who guys, I believe, started 0-7 in SEC play last year and did not win an SEC series until, I believe, later in the season. Only won one SEC series all season long. So, you know, baseball's a marathon, guys. It's not a sprint. I don't know that hitting a panic button is the right move. But, guys, I mean, I publish this on social media, and I tell you all, I I'm not going to hide it. I, I don't think Mark Kingston's the guy to get South Carolina baseball back to where fans want it to be. I, I just 
you know, we talk about how long does it take to identify a college football coach? Are they the guy or not? Guys, this is year seven of Mark Kingston. Season six, year seven. Like, by now, you know what you have. And, you know, I, I understand Gamecock Nation has high expectations of the baseball program, but there's a reason why. Like, those expectations are fair, right? Like, Mark's not going to cower behind any situation or circumstance for Florida football, right? Like, the expectations are what they are. We don't give a damn how high you think they are. That's the standard for the program. Same thing goes for, for Georgia football fans or LSU baseball fans or Duke or North Carolina basketball fans. Like, the standard is what it is. And I just don't think Mark Kingston's the guy to get South Carolina back to that standard, back to one of the elites in the SEC. And, I mean, guys, they haven't been to Omaha in over a decade. So, uh, I think they can turn it around. I mean, I think this is a team that can still get the 500 in SEC play and be in the postseason chase. But I, I, I don't see Mark Kingston, unless, guys, they make it to Omaha this year, maybe if they make it to a super, things will calm down. If they don't make it to that point, guys, I, I think fans are going to be fed up and ready for a change. That sounds an awful lot, Chris, like the way we've been talking about Brad Brownell. It just, just making the tournament may not necessarily be enough. He needs to make it into the round of – 16 or the elite eight to really save his job interesting how those two parallel yeah i mean i, I would say too guys even more emphasis with south carolina because this is a program that 10 years ago won back-to-back -back national championships and went to a third consecutive so like you know clemson basketball wants to make it to march madness because obviously that's what matters in college basketball it's a tournament sport they don't have some grand history i mean i'm not trying to even take a slight at clemson basketball i mean they're not they're not Duke. They're not in the Final Four or Sweet 16 all the time. South Carolina has actually got history and tradition, and they've done it before. They've won big. And, like, guys, they're not even close to that right now. So um, I think there's going to be a very difficult decision, more than likely, to make it season 10. Chris Phillips joining us here on the show. Chris, are Gamecock fans more into the men's tournament or the women's tournament? That's a good question, Mark, and I feel like you're trying to make me piss some people off. That's a, that's, that's what I'm we just, do uh, we listen, Led. You know, we do that on this show. Like that's that's I, you I, know, like it's there is an answer to that question. The questions that that play in my brain on the screen in my brain naturally just piss people off. It's been doing that for five years. Hey, I'm right there with you, Mark. I know how it feels. Um, but no, realistically, Mark, I mean, I would say this. I think folks are more fired up for the men's tournament because it's something that happens so much more rarely. Like at this point, guys, and I say this respectfully, but I mean, the season doesn't even begin for Gamecocks women's basketball until the Elite Eight. I mean, they're going to cruise the rest of the way. Like there's not enough parity in the women's game in my opinion. Like watch the first round game of the women's. The line on that game is probably going to be South Carolina minus 45 or something crazy. So, I mean – you know, I think folks are obviously very, very fired up, and there's a chip on the shoulder because they didn't win it last year. But, I mean, first time since 2017 you're in the NCAA tournament, you're finally in a big dance. And I know that the women's game and the women's tournament is going to garner a ton of interest, but nothing measures up. The March Madness, the men's NCAA tournament, I think the excitement at a fever pitch. And, again, that just goes to show how excited people are and how much interest there is. And, again, it's something that – Don Staley and company, it, it, it's like being a fan of the Patriots when Tom Brady was quarterback, guys. It's like the regular season's kind of just for fun, and the playoffs is when the real season begins. It almost becomes spoiled. Men's basketball fans of South Carolina have not reached that point yet. This is a brand-new experience, and certainly I think that leads to a fever pitch of excitement. Who goes the furthest in March Madness from the SEC, Chris, and how many in the Sweet, St Sweet 16 does the SEC get? You know, it's funny, Mark. I have not filled out my bracket yet. I'll be doing that tonight and then dropping the full picks probably tomorrow. Um, but right now, off the top of my head, you know, it's really tough to say Tennessee because they're just so notorious for these early exits. Uh, Auburn's obviously hot with what they did in the SEC tournament. I think proved to be – guys, I think Auburn could lose their first game to Yale really, truly. Based like on what? That, Based on what? Hey, Gale's got some athletic guards, guys. They got some athletic guards. Mark, I'm going to be dropping predictions, and it's going to be madness. I, I, just because you know basketball does not mean you're going to have a good bracket. You know that, and I know that. So I'm going to be asking. I'm going to be asking my girlfriend about what to pick. She's 
probably going to go off colors and mascots. And her bracket will probably be better than mine. Like, that's how March Madness works. So, I'm just saying, Yale could be a sneaky game. But I do like Auburn. I still do like Tennessee with Dalton Connect. Um, I don't trust Kentucky. They've got the talent, but I don't trust them. I think South Carolina can make a run of the Sweet 16. They just got to get past Oregon. But I think certainly they've got the talent. Texas A&M, hey, listen, they're so inconsistent. But Buzz Williams squad, when they get in tournament play, they love it, man. The fact they snuck in, they love it. Uh, Mississippi State's dangerous. I don't think they will. And then Florida, Mark, I, I really do think Florida, as athletic as they are and as long as they are, I, I think they could make a run as well. So I know I kind of dodged the, you know, dodged the answer a little bit. And maybe that was intentional somewhat. But uh, yeah, you guys will see the filled out bracket when I drop it. There we go, man. There we go. Florida would have to get by Marquette. Jay Billis has not a single team from the state of South Carolina winning a game. Has New Mexico beating Clemson. Has Oregon beating South Carolina. Uh, has Alabama beating College of Charleston. How about that? Chris Phillips, SEC Unfiltered. Great content going on there. SEC Unfiltered on Twitter or X. Chris, always appreciate you, man. Thank you so much for all you do and for joining us on the show today. Mark and Diesel, you guys are awesome. Enjoy March Madness this weekend. We'll talk soon. Yes, sir. All right, Chris Phillips, my friends. And we've got the top five at five coming your way next right here on the most interactive sports talk show anywhere. It's Offsides. Mark Ryan and Diesel, the fan upstate. What's good, my friends? This is the most interactive sports talk show anywhere. It's Offsides, Mark Ryan and Diesel, and we are the Fan Upstate rolling on until 7 o'clock p.m. today. Thrilled to have you guys with us. Always do appreciate you. Come rain or shine, here's how you can take part in the show. You can give us a ring at 844-FAN-PHONE. That's 844-326-3663. And the text line is there for you at 71307. Just start your text with the word fan, and away you go on the show. It is time, my friends, to do that jam. We call it the top five at five, the top five biggest sports stories of the day, the top five topics we're discussing. Ladies and gentlemen of the upstate, Offsiders, the top five at five starts right now. And now, the top five at five. And five, four, three, two, one. Hit it. Five. At number five today. Guys, listen. We might as well put this on the rules of sports fandom. All right? You should only have one bracket. You, you should only have one bracket, period. I can't stand these folks that have multiple fantasy football teams, multiple brackets. What do you actually believe is going to happen? Because I end up doing multiple bracket challenges uh, every single year. And you know what? My bracket is the same in all of them. In all of them. I've got a friend who does a bracket challenge where, like, if a 12 beats a 5, you get one point for the win and then seven points because a 12 seed is seven seeds away from a five seed. He encourages you to call call upsets. My bracket is the same as there as it is in my regular bracket. That's the way that it goes. One bracket, no multiple brackets, okay? Stop cheating. Stop hedging. Stop being Switzerland, all right? One bracket and roll with it. Them's the rules, okay? If you got multiple brackets, what do you really believe? What are you really saying? Who knows? Next up. Four. At number four today, we are tasking you with this challenge. Who is your Cinderella? Who is your Cinderella, my friends, this year? <coughs> well, you've got some candidates. Stetson. The, the rule on Cinderella's is you got to be in at least 11, 11 seed. Okay, preferably a smaller school, but at least 11, an 11 seed or lower. Here are your choices. 
You've got Stetson. You've got UAB. You've got Yale. Okay. You've got Duquesne. Moorhead State. You've got South Dakota State. You have got Howard and Wagner. And you've got Grand Canyon University. You've got College of Charleston. You've got Colgate. You can brush with Colgate. Never have to go to the dentist. You've got Long Beach State University. Longwood University. You've got James Madison, Vermont. Vermont takes on the Dukies. You've got Oakland and Western Kentucky. You've got Montana State and Grambling. You've got McNeese State. You've got Samford. You've got Oregon. You've got uh, Akron. You've got St. Peter's. Who is your Cinderella this year? I like two out of the same bracket. Boy, a a, a 12 seed beats a five seed about 75% of the years. All right. I like McNeese over Gonzaga. And I think Samford as a 13 has a real chance against four seed Kansas, who has suffered some truly blowout losses this year. Diesel, you got a, uh, a Cinderella in mind for this year. You got a Cinderella in mind. What you think and what you lead in is it the Dukies of James Madison. What do you say? James Madison is a really good basketball team. They have the ability to be that type of team. Uh, I have not filled out my bracket either, but looking from an 11 seed or down, I mean, I don't think NC State is going to be able to carry on the hot play that they had during the NCAA turn, or excuse me, during the ACC tournament. Um, again, not having had a, had an opportunity to fill out my bracket. Um, I think it would be interesting and funny if Virginia did it. Uh, Virginia is a team that a lot of people say shouldn't even be in the tournament. I do think New Mexico is going to beat Clemson, but I don't think they're going to get past Baylor after that. Um, I'm going to say only for the for the schadenfreude, for the chaos that they call, caused at the end of their tournament, which we have the audio for, which we'll play at some point later on in the show today, I'm going to say that it's Grand Canyon U. GCU makes a deep run to, at minimum, the Sweet 16. Wow, the Sweet 16, Grand Canyon University. You've seen this, right? Yeah. With with 12 seconds left, up oh, 12 yeah. points, or three seconds left, up 12, GCU player dunks the ball, and then the opposing player throws the ball back at him and hits him. I mean, it's it, it turned into a kerfuffle, a brouhaha. There you go. All right, guys, next up. Three. What about the South Carolina State teams? First time in 20-plus years that three teams from the state of South Carolina have made March Madness. First time in uh, 26 years that Clemson and South Carolina have both made it in the same season. So how many wins is the state of South Carolina going to get? What do you say? Well, Jay Billis says the Palmetto State's getting zero. That's right. Oh, boy. Here's what it says. South Carolina, Oregon. Uh, Jay Jay Billis says medium upset potential. South Carolina plays at a slower tempo so it can hang with better teams, but lesser teams can stay in it against the Gamecocks too. And Jay Billis says winner, Oregon. Coach Dana Altman has never lost a a first-round game since he showed up in Eugene. South Carolina is going to be tough, but a healthy Dante will be the difference. A healthy Dante. Uh, Oregon's front court star front court player is returning. What about Clemson uh, going up against New Mexico? Here we go, man. Here we go. Here's what he says. Coach Brad Brownell had an NCAA tournament team last season, but was snubbed by the committee. This year, there was no question. Road wins at Alabama, North Carolina, Pittsburgh, Syracuse, and Florida State bolstered a strong case for its at-large berth. Brownell has a great inside-outside combo in P.J. Hall and Joe Girard, the top two scorers. Hall can step away and drill a three and also dominate in the paint, while Girard is a great three-point shooter and an automatic free-throw shooter. Clemson is a better offensive team than a defensive team, and its defense is solid but not spectacular. Then he says upset potential is medium. Clemson is not a knockout punch, up-tempo team, but can hang with anybody when playing its best. The Tigers have not closed out some games late and have lost some close ones. 
He says the upset pick potential is high. New Mexico is his pick. This is an upset pick. Clemson has been uninspired at certain times, and the Lobos are really good offensively. I don't like either team to get past Baylor. Oh, boy. So Jay Billis says best-case scenario for Clemson is one win in the tournament. More on that coming your way in the next segment. He also says College of Charleston has it in them to upset Alabama, but he's picking Alabama for the win. Next up. Two. At number two, guys, Kirk Cousins and Russell Wilson being on the move. Kenny Pickett and uh, Justin Fields as well had me do a little study of how older quarterbacks, old faces in new places perform in their new digs. And I was all expecting to say, yeah, you can't really expect much out of guys this old. But guys, the research changed my mind. Matt Stafford won a Super Bowl new team. Peyton Manning won a Super Bowl new team. Peyton Manning won a Super Bowl, won an MVP at 40, Super Bowl MVP at 43, Pro Bowl player at the age of 44. Good gosh, man. Uh, you know, and then you go down the line. Joe Montana made a uh, conference championship game. These Pro Bowl caliber older quarterbacks that tr- change places, old faces, new places, typically work out pretty well. Very well. Out of eight I studied, only one didn't work out. So you're thinking, okay, Aaron Rodgers, Jets. Well, it's the Jets. Can it work out? But Kirk Cousins, probably going to take Atlanta Falcons to the playoffs. Russell Wilson, probably going to take the Pittsburgh Steelers beyond the playoffs. And Kenny Pickett, who felt entitled to the Pittsburgh job, despite the fact that in his career has just 13 touchdowns and 13 interceptions, His total career touchdowns, 13 touchdowns, is one fewer than Russell Wilson had in his worst season. And he deserves to be the starter. Right. My backside. Not buying it at all. Well, one of the good things, I'll I'll be willing to bet that the reason for that is a lot of these MVP caliber older quarterbacks, they have the right to be selective. They're not going to garbage teams. Not talking to you, Aaron Rodgers, but the other guys you listed, they can choose good situations or they can pick and choose the situation that they think they're going to be successful in. So number one, you've had all your success at your old location. Things got a little bit stale and you're sitting there thinking to yourself, I'm rich. Still got a little something in the tank. I want to go somewhere that I know has got good wide receivers, somewhere that's got an offensive coordinator that I like or that I've worked with before or a head coach that I liked or I've worked with before. So I get to pick where I want to go, or I just ride off into the sunset, a rich man. So I'd be willing to bet that's, that has something to do with it. And finally, one. did you guys see this? Did you guys see NC state NC state beat Duke and North Carolina in the same ACC tournament in so doing, becoming the first team in any conference tournament history to win five games in five days. And they're hella fun to watch. They got this big beefcake guy who looks way overweight, but nobody can stop him from backing down. So you got to double team him, right? And that that leaves open NC State shooters. Well, you know, you, you say, well, Mark Ryan, well, what was their recent play? NC State lost four games in a row before the ACC tournaments. I mean, how do you explain this? They lost their last four games before the ACC tournament. Then they win five games in a row in the ACC tournament, beating each of the top three seeds. They beat North Carolina. They beat Duke. They beat Virginia in overtime. One of the more amazing things we've ever seen, it is reported that St. John's may have been the team that was left out. Because NC State got in. You know, my wife is a North Carolina fan. It was hard for her not to cheer for what NC State was doing, man. Hard, it's just insane. It's like the most unforeseen thing you could ever see. Especially because they give you no way out with that five games in five days nonsense. Yet they did it. Congratulations, Wolfpack. You are in and have earned your way. Notes. 
are today's top five at five. Now it's your chance to chime in, which you can do at 844-FAN-PHONE. That's 844-F-A-N-F-O-N-E. That's 844-326-3663 on the Renewal by Anderson Fan Phone. The text line is there for you at 71307. Just start your text with the word fan and away you go. You can get to us on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube at the Fan Upstate on every one. Please like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and subscribe to us on YouTube. And finally, email. You guys can all email the show. Mark Ryan, that is M-A-R-C Ryan at thefanupstate.com. All the different ways you can get in touch with us here on the most interactive sports radio show anywhere. Let's see what you guys are saying. Uh, Diesel, you had said this to me earlier. I don't think the teams that got the most snubbed are the teams that had their bubbles burst. I think the teams that were snubbed the most are those that won their regular season championship but didn't win their tournament and got left out. Why? Because science tells us the more accurate results, that the greater the sample size, the more accurate the results. The tur- th- this this uh, system that we have rewards a team that wins four games in four days but does not win the, reward the team that wins the most games in four months. So I got a problem with that. These are the teams that were the most screwed of anybody, those teams that dropped great conference records but didn't win their conference tournament and are staying home. Look, I've been uh, a proponent of a, of a two-bid system where each conference, 32 conferences, two bids each makes a 64-team field. I could even take away the AQ if you win your conference tournament. You just The only way to automatically qualify is to win your regular season. Outside of that, everybody's got something left to prove. So go do it in your conference tournament and then prove that you deserve to be in. But uh, but per what you said, 15 conference champions did not get in to the, um, to the NCAA tournament. Uh, it, it really is 14, but the Atlantic 10, in the Atlantic 10, Loyola, Chicago, and Richmond tied with, a, uh, with an equal conference slate. Out of the 15 teams who won their regular season, who didn't get into the NCAA tournament, they had a total record mark of 214 and 46. That is some elite basketball being played across these, these 15 seasons. But the teams that won their co- regular season conference but did not make the NCAA tournament, Eastern Kentucky out of the Atlantic Sun, South Florida out of the American Athletic, Loyola and Richmond both who tied out of the Atlantic 10, Eastern Washington from the Big Sky, High Point from the Big South, UC Irvine from the Big West, St- Sam Houston State from Conference USA, Princeton out of the Ivy League, Quinnipiac out of the Metro Atlantic, Toledo from the MAC, Norfolk State from the Mid-Eastern Conference, Indiana State from Missouri Valley, which I'm surprised that one just because of the storylines that they didn't find a way to squeeze those guys in somehow. Uh, let's see, Central Connecticut from the Northeast Conference, Moorhead, uh, me, not Moorhead State, they are in. Uh, let's see here. Uh, App State out of the Sun Belt. That is the final one. So those 15 teams won their regular season but did not make the NCAA tournament. And you know what, in effect, the selection committee is telling all of the teams from those conferences is that your regular season doesn't matter. Yeah. Like the only month of basketball that matters to you is March. Nothing you do for the Floridas of the world, the Gamecocks of the world, the Clemsons of the world, they're earning a seed, they're earning their birth so that they don't have to rely on the conference tournament to get in. But like these guys, these teams have had outstanding seasons, and it doesn't even matter. It doesn't even matter. You've got... Um, it's like a Lincoln Park song. South Florida's a 16-2. and 16-2. and two. Richmond Spiders, 15-3 and three in the Atlantic 10. You know, um, you've got Eastern Washington, 15-3 and three in the big sky. You've got... You've got um, let me see here. You've got uh, who else here? You've got um, Princeton, twelve and two in the Ivy League, twelve and two in the Ivy League. Toledo, as Diesel said, won their conference four years in a row, but didn't win the conference tournament. Doesn't go fourteen and four in the MAC. You would These think are that the teams that get screwed. You would think that the the helmet scouting, the reading the, the the jersey on the name on the front of the jersey for Toledo, who's been that good four years in a row, would be enough to earn them. At at large, but you know it—it it just stinks when the NCAA, the selection committee, says 
sorry, no, your regular season doesn't matter. I mean, App State had a win over a four-seed Auburn. They have two wins over James Madison. They won 27 games this year. Didn't even get mentioned. Didn't even get mentioned it as the first four out. Up next on the show, what are the scenarios regarding this Clemson coach and his future employment? That's next. My name is Mark Ryan. He's Diesel. And you're listening to the most interactive sports talk show anywhere. It's Offsides, Mark Ryan and Diesel, and we are the fan upstate. <laughs> Mad craft. I'm glad you picked up that reference. When you said in the end, it doesn't even matter. That's like the park song. Uh, let's see. Uh, JD, good point there as well. Hey, guys, thanks for being a part of the show today. You guys were rocking on the uh, on the comment section, man. This might be the busiest comment section day we've had in quite a while, and it's because of you. Love you guys. Take care, man. We will see you tomorrow.